This is The Meaningful Way. I'm your host, Luke Iorio. Hello there, Meaningful Way listeners. So I know something about you, but let me throw a few questions your way. Are you someone that might be stuck in a pattern of your own doing? Do occasionally you feel like you're a bit of a creature of habit and perhaps maybe you're seeking to change your ways, break through what's holding you back and lead with more confidence? If so, then this is one of those episodes where you wanna tune in and even turn up the volume because today's guest is a masterful coach who has taught time crunch managers and leaders across the corporate landscape how to leverage impact and at the same time work less while still reaping the rewards of a job well done. And if you can believe it, you can produce these stellar results in 10 minutes or less. Intrigued yet? I sure hope so. So to begin introducing our incredible guest, Michael Bungay Stanier, let's begin, as he does, with a George Orwell quote. An autobiography is only to be trusted when it reveals something disgraceful. In that vein, Michael Bungay, Bungay Stanier was banned from his high school graduation for the balloon incident, which was sued by, pursued then by one of his law school lecturers for defamation and managed to give himself a concussion while digging a hole as a laborer. There's going to be some story. We're going to have to begin with that one. We'll get to that in a moment. So luckily, there's been some upside to where this began. He's the author of a number of books, and the one he is best known for, with more than 90,000 copies sold, is Do More Great Work. However, the one he's most proud of at this point is End Malaria, a collection of articles about great work from thought leaders that's raised about $400,000 for Malaria No More and even reached number two on Amazon.com. Michael also organized the Great Work MBA, a virtual conference featuring 30 world-class speakers, which had more than 10,000 registered participants. All of this is done as founder and senior partner of Box of Crayons, an absolutely fantastic name for a business. We're going to ask about that one, too. And it's a company that helps organizations do less... Uh, good work and do more great work. Their focus is on helping time crunch managers coach in 10 minutes or less and their Fortune 500 clients include TD Bank, Kraft, Gartner, and VMware. And today we are going to dive in with Michael. We're going to talk a little bit about this journey and we're also going to chat about his latest book, The Coaching Habit. And so with that build up, Michael, welcome to The Meaningful Way. That, that is quite a build up. I, <laughs> I, I'm now anxious that this is going to be a massive anticlimax for anybody who's listened the whole way through that. But thank you, Luke. I appreciate it. Well, there's there's really just only one place to begin, and that's got to be with the balloon incident. I mean, when that leads <laughs> off your body, we got to hear something because I know that this has an impact later on in your life. So. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, so last year of high school and, uh, you know, like in most high schools, there's a kind of hijinks on your final day. However, it coincided for us with our headmaster's last day as well, his last year. Um, he'd been headmaster for 40 years or something venerable. And we got pretty thoroughly warned, you're not allowed to do anything, anything, <laughs> in part because the people the year before us had, you know, they'd done things like let sheep into the front courtyard of the school and and put glue in all the locks and basically caused chaos. So anyway, we're like, we can't do nothing. I mean, it's our last day at high school. Come on. So in a very gentle way, um, myself and a group of uh, friends went to our, our chapel. We were a kind of Christian school, I guess. Um, and it was conical roof and we filled the top of the, the, the roof with gas filled, helium filled balloons. So honestly, it was the most, the mildest of things, you know, <laughs> like, but, but it was a great lesson in overreaction because, you know, we got banned. There was a little hubbub. It wasn't quite building a wall along the U.S.-Mexican border, but that was kind of the level of re response to it. So, uh, yeah, it was an interesting, it was an interesting moment. Another one of those great lessons about how does power work, how does status work, how does mm -hmm. helping people save face work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you and I were talking before we got going on this of another time where I spoke at the ICF conference and mm -hmm. trod on a few toes there as well. And so probably there's something in my DNA that just likes to be a bit provocative. 
You know, there's something in that because I, I really like where it tied in. It sounds like it ties into some of these other stories and, and then what you bring up with the presentations of uh, back at the ICF of how people do get wrapped up in kind of their identity and taking things quite so seriously uh, and perhaps overly so. And that seems to be uh, the part of what you have, for lack of a better term, fought against uh, from a professional standpoint with Box of Crayons. And so I was right. wondering if you could, you could chat a little bit about, uh, I guess maybe actually let's start with this, because I've heard you talk uh, about one of the pieces I absolutely love from Jim Collins, where he talks about this idea of firing bullets before you fire the mm. cannon, right? Finding that aim, testing yeah. things out, and then once you got it, go for it. Could you tell us a little bit about that buildup and how this kind of challenging the norm, challenging the status quo, uh, challenging maybe the too seriousness of what is out there? Yeah. Tell us a bit about that background, and then ultimately, how does it lead to this incredible mm. work you're doing today with Box of Crayons? Well, thanks. That's a great question. I mean, I'll try and be succinct about it. <laughs> you know, there's just part of me that's got a degree of wiring to go, look, when people are zigging, how can I zag? Mm. I mean, who knows where this comes from? I probably could have therapy on it or something to find <laughs> out. But, um, you know, n n none of my the rest of my family, my parents or my brothers have this, so it's just... I think it's just part of the way I'm wired. Um, I've always gone, yeah, you know what? You gotta, you gotta tr not completely trust the dominant hierarchy and the dominant way of thinking. There's probably not the whole truth there. And, um, I mean, this is going to take a kind of bizarre turn, but when I when I studied my master's degree in literature, I I studied under um, well, I studied a theorist called Bakhtin, and his whole piece was around it's in the carnival that people are allowed to kind of blow off steam and break rules in a way that is safe in a way that helps the the, the normal culture survive, mm. and I think there's something very interesting about trying to figure out the balance between uh, rebellion and allowing society to be stable and normal and generous. Um, and so part of that comes from going, all right, any time I, I see kind of a degree of, hmm, let's call it self-congratulatoryness getting together about this is the way and this is the thing and this is the truth, I'm always like, okay, let's stir this up a bit and see what we can do. And, you know, Luke, my company is called Box of Crayons, and yet we serve Fortune 1000 companies. Mm -hmm. And you can guess there have been times where we've had people go, that's a ridiculous name, <laughs> and we're not hiring anybody called Box of Crayons. Why would we? But in my experience, what what's actually happened is people – um, either dislike the name or they like it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that's actually quite a, a smart move as a brand. What you want is actually to create a response to the brand, not just indifference to the brand. Yeah. So, you know, as I look at our, our five core values as a company, the five core values are provoke impact, be generous, pursue elegance, have fun, and nurture adult-to-adult -adult relationships. And you can guess that the provoke impact value is a key part of how we want to show up at Box of Crowns and how I, Michael, want to show up in my own life as well. That's a, that's a very rambly answer. I'm not even sure what answer a question I'm answering anymore, but that's my best go at it. But it gives us a glimpse. It gives us a glimpse of, of how things have come together. And I think that uh, that idea of provoking impact, I, I want to kind of tie it to what you're working on and have been working on with the coaching yeah. habit, because what what I found in the coaching habit and really appreciated was that, uh, you know, initially I pick it up because of my background and what I do from from being in the coaching so. profession and training schools. And yet when I look at it and when I read it and I go into it, there's so much more that's going on here. And uh, the questions that are posed, which we'll talk a little bit about in a, in a little while, the questions that are posed are much more about opening up perspective, opening up life as well as leadership. Right. They just happen to be framed from a particular perspective uh, that we call coaching. And so <laughs> I, I guess maybe the place to begin, because I think mm -hmm. this is where you're, you're going at with Provoke Impact, is that you open the book with one of the opening statements that we all need a coaching habit. And I yeah. was curious if you could elaborate on, you know, what do you mean by we need a coaching habit? Okay, so I love how you're, you're making connections that I even hadn't figured out, so I love this. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you, in terms of this whole piece around trying to stir things up and be a bit provocative and not accept the kind of dominant way of thinking, I actually have a bit of a bug in my head around coaching because I mm. think coaching shows up with a lot of baggage for people. Either you're like 
on one side of the fence going, I don't know, coaches, they're slightly weird. They're slightly, they're all from California. They're all life coaches. There's all a certain type. Mm -hmm. Um, That's one way of doing it. Or there's people who are on the other side of the fence who are going, I am a life coach and I am an executive coach and we're awesome and we're ruling the world and we're fantastic (laughs) for that. Mm -hmm. And that's not the whole truth. You know, it's part of the truth, but it's not the whole truth, both sides of that equation. And, If I had to point to a a thing that I'm really interested in doing, it's trying to make the whole idea of coaching normal and everyday and accessible to everyone, not to a kind of smaller elite, if you like. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to go, well, what what are we even talking about? Because what does coaching even mean? Mm -hmm. Because, as you know, there's about 8,000 different definitions of coaching. Mm Mm-hmm each one trademarked by the particular coaching school that's actually trying to peddle you something. Here's how I think about coaching. And it's very simple. At a behavioral level, coaching is simply how do you stay curious just a little bit longer? How do you rush into action and advice giving just a little bit slower? Mm -hmm. So it's really, really foundational, really basic. It's really a moment where you go, okay, this is happening. How do I see that other person for who they are? How do I rush to advice slower? How do I stay curious about who they are and what they're, what they're up to just a little bit longer? And that's where I get to be able to make the statement that I think everybody could do with a coaching habit. I'm not trying to turn everybody into a coach. We have enough of those, honestly, already. What I do want are people to have this way of showing up and going, look, we are so wired to leap in, to fix things, to solve things, to give advice, to maintain control, to be the smart person. Mm-hmm. How do you give some of that up for your sake, but also for the sake of the people with whom you're in conversation? You know, I think where, where you're going with that is something that I've seen very much expanding what what this field marketplace, whatever whatever we want to label it as, is going in the direction of, because it is a wider uh, application. It is a wider angle of how can we use some of these things within our lives, yeah. within our work, to get the benefits just right there at an everyday level. And that idea of the curious little longer, you know, let the advice come a little slower, gives us that moment of pause. It gives us that moment to reflect, to be mindful of what are all the things we want to consider yeah. before we dive in. And that to right. me sounds as practical as it can be, regardless of uh, kind of what position we hold in, in life or within work. The, exactly. And, and, and yeah. just to be clear, I mean, this is, I mean, coaching is simple but difficult. Because yes. simple, it really is about, look, can you just, don't, don't give me advice for a minute, just ask a question instead. <laughs> What's hard is mm-hmm. we are all so ingrained to kind of rush into that advice giving place for all sorts of reasons mm-hmm. that that shift is actually quite tricky. But I love how you're speaking to it going, look, no matter who you are, mm-hmm. whether you're officially a coach, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent, whether you're just a normal person showing up, you can bring some of this into the way that you operate. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think if we apply this to – there was a, um, a couple of, I think, what you labeled the vicious circles in, mm. in the workplace that you, you label in the, in, the, in the book Coaching Habit. And it's funny when I read them, and, and I'll read the names out in just a second – I looked at them like, oh, this is, you say the workplace, this could be in a family. <laughs> this yeah. could be in, you know, in the neighborhood. This could be at the PTA. Yeah. Uh, because these, these three vicious cycles of being uh, creating over-dependence, getting overwhelmed, and being disconnected. And so yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about these, these uh, circles that occur. I like the fact you refer to them as circles because they do tend to spiral around in this manner. Yeah. And how is it this, this coaching habit, this this being curious a little longer, the advice a little slower, how does it yeah. help us begin to break these cycles, these circles? Yeah, great. So first of all, I really appreciate you seeing beyond the obvious audience the book is written for, because it's true that I, when I wrote it, I was like, okay, if I had to pick anybody, a type of person to read it, it is <laughs> the busy but engaged manager or leader. She's trying to do the best she can. She's feeling overwhelmed. She's just going, how do I lift my game in terms of being a leader? <laughs> but really, I'm writing it for anybody who interacts with other human beings because I think all of the <laughs> stuff in there can really help. <laughs> so the three vicious circles, I mean, there's a, there is that sense of, first of all, being – having an we call it an over-dependent team, but it's really just having people who are asking too much of you. Mm -hmm. And somehow you've got yourself in a position where you're being drained by people, where you're kind of um, 
what's the codependent would be this the jargony way of putting it right. uh, where you're in a position where you go god all i do is try and help other people but it doesn't seem to help them it seems to get us stuck in a slightly dysfunctional way of working together so there's that then there's that sense of overwhelm and that doesn't need any introduction i mean <laughs> everybody's got that sense of oh my god there's so much going on too many meetings too many emails too many obligations too many rushing the kids here and there everybody's going at a pace that is just flat out Mm -hmm. and then that disconnected piece you know uh, a book i wrote five or six years ago called do more great work basically says that that, that everything you do whether you're a a, you know working or not working everything you do falls into one of three buckets it's either bad work good work or great work and bad work if you like is the kind of time wasting life sucking (laughs) bureaucracy you know it doesn't matter if you're working for a big company or your own company or you're not working you know what that means good work is your job description and we all have job descriptions again whether we have them officially or not it's the, it's the day-to-day stuff that you need to keep things going but great work i think of as the work that has more impact and the work that has more meaning Mm. Impact meaning what's going to make the difference out there in the world. Meaning is about what lights me up. What do I care about? You know, in coach speak, what are my values? What do I stand for? And that disconnect, that's the third vicious circle. The disconnect is going, how do you get back to getting clear about a little more great work in your life? Mm. And when you ask really almost everybody and you say, okay, Who has too much great work right now? Too much of the work that has meaning, too much of the work that has impact. There aren't many people who stick up their hand. There are a few, but there aren't very many. Um, And so that disconnect is part of that. And actually the slowing down and asking questions is part of the solution to break out of all three of those vicious circles. Mm -hmm. And if we could, you know, it's interesting. I, I, let me take it in this direction, then I want to come to these these questions that you've posed in this book, because I think there's some very interesting focal points that you've, you've chosen here. But that idea of defining great work as tied to impact and meaning, where is it that you guide people to begin identifying that in, in themselves so that they can begin to identify, how do I find that meaning I'm most connected to? How do I identify that impact mm. that I'd love to have in the world? You know, there's, there's a bunch of great coaching techniques around that so anybody listening in if they have a coach or they work with a coach they can probably find some guidance around that but here's one of the ways that i like best i'll give you two ways Mm -hmm. the first is this and this is the one i use most often for myself and for others i have people think back to and recount a, a peak moment you know tell a story of a peak moment a time when you felt at your best a time when you faced a challenge you rose to the challenge and you're like oh, that was a that was me at my you know that's a good version of me coming forth there my hypothesis would be that when you tell that story what that story is actually giving you a clue to is what are the values what are the seeds what are the principles of who you are in this world mm-hmm. you know uh and if you can get clear on what your values are, what you stand for, one of the simplest formula around doing more great work is you figure out what your values are and then you amp them up. <laughs> you move mm-hmm. from living them six out of 10 to eight out of 10 to nine out of 10. And I can promise you that if you show up more fully going, I'm living consistently with what I think my three or four or five core values are, you will definitely do more great work. The other thing that I found useful for me is I look to people who are role models and heroes for me or even brands that I like. And I go, okay, what they're doing is that somebody who's a hero, some some person or something is a role model for me, some brand I like, they are somehow embodying something that matters to me that I aspire to have more of. So, for instance, uh, I love Cirque du Soleil. You know, it's a great Canadian brand, and as a kind of Australian who's ended up in Canada, I'm <laughs> all for that. But I just love how they blew up the old idea of what a circus was, how they're endlessly creative, how they're they're physical, how they're playful. 
And actually, the fact that I like, I love Cirque du Soleil tells me about something about who I am in this world. You know, I like to be playful. I like to be creative. I like to be provocative. Mm-hmm. I like to break the rules. You know, in that brand, there's a mirror to who I am. Mm-hmm. And once I see who I am, I can turn up the volume on myself to do more great work. You know, I really appreciate where you just brought that in, in terms of when we look at what those uh, exemplifying models are, those role models are that we want to aspire to. Sometimes we too often look at them as, oh, I wish I had more of, but I love that you just tied that as a mirror instead so that people can recognize the reason why I'm attracted to that, the reason why I, I want more of that, as it were, is there's actually something already within me that yeah. resonates there. I think yeah, that's a exactly. wonderful way to tie that back. Thanks. So let's so let's t- let's take a look then at these seven questions that you mm. have posed in the book because I think there's uh, it's a form of leadership. There's a lot that's there that actually evokes some of that impact as well as meaning that we want to have so we do more great yes. work. So tell me a little bit about the where what was the nature? Where did these seven questions come from because they cover quite a wide spectrum in in terms of of you know the the focal points that yeah. they cover. So you, you've already put your finger on it, which is I wanted to make sure I covered a wide range of different moments where it felt useful to ask a good question. Mm-hmm. But it kind of goes back further than that. I mean, really, when I started doing my coach training 15 or 20 years ago, as I watched the masterful coaches who were teaching me and role modeling for me, I really just went, you know, it's all about the questions. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at a great coach and you're like, they just seem to have the right questions. Mm-hmm. So right from the start, I mean, I've been collecting questions for a long time. And, you know, when I first started coaching and, you know, when you're first starting to coach, you've got all that anxiety about what if I get it wrong? What should I ask? What if I go blank? I mean, I just had my my computer screen and my desk covered in post-it notes, all of which were like, here are my top 58 questions just in case. <laughs> But one of the, you heard me say earlier on that one of our core values at Box of Crayons is to pursue elegance. And part of what elegance is is going, what's the least that could be the most? Mm. And for me, it, I, I, although I honestly, I wrote a version of the book, which was like, here are my favorite 175 questions. And it was a terrible book. Um, mm. What I really decided is, okay. If I'm trying to serve a manager, if I'm trying to make them feel that coaching is an accessible thing that they could do, Mm. what I want to do is give them the most practical and least overwhelming amount of stuff that I can to help them. Mm. So my goal with this book was to write the shortest possible book I could that would still be useful. Mm. So, look, I played around. You know, I I started at 175. I went Mm. down to three. I went back to 11. I popped around at eight. And, you know, I just kept playing with questions until I went, okay, I got. I think what we got here are th- seven questions. You can use all of them in a single conversation. They're, they're not redundant. Mm-hmm. Um, they each serve a very specific purpose. I mean, the questions, we call them the learning question. How do you finish a conversation so it so the person actually takes something of value away? You know, uh, the, the strategy question, what's at the essence of being strategic? What are the choices you face there? Uh, the kickstart question, how do you start a conversation so you get into the juicy bits faster? Mm-hmm. They, they all serve a specific purpose and they all play well together. And, you know, I'm trying to serve the busy person. I want to give them less rather than more so they can really amplify their impact. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the – well, I guess maybe two things on this because a big part of this is exactly as you, you were saying is how is it that you can boil this down so that leaders really can get their hands around it and get down to the essence of it. Uh, we talk on the show all the time of how leadership really is about that impact, that influence that we have uh, on others and Ideally, we do that consciously. We do it intentionally. And so what do you believe it is maybe about these questions that really allow leaders to connect to their people, their teams, in a way that's very different than how they used to? You know, Luke, I'm not sure that there's it's massively different mm-hmm. other than that foundational change we talked about behaviorally, which is a little less advice, a little more curiosity. Mm-hmm. What it does though, is it just says, look, it's easy enough to talk about less advice. It's really hard to do it because you've just spent five, 10, 20 years telling people what to do. You've got mm-hmm. some pretty deep habits here. So what, 
we're trying to do is say, look, try this, ask the question, shut up, <laughs> <laughs> listen to the answer, ask and what else? So that that same question gets a deeper dive and you can go a little further. Mm -hmm. Listen, ask again, and what else? <laughs> mm -hmm. See where now where the question takes you. Mm -hmm. And really, it's just to say to them, because, you know, the greatest, the greatest uh, resistance people have to trying to be more coach-like is, I don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. I'm really busy. Have you seen, have you mm -hmm. seen my to-do list? Have you seen my inbox? Mm -hmm. But what, what is amazing is just how far and how deep and how quickly you can go if you have the discipline to ask a few good questions yeah. and actually listen to the answer and push them a little further. I mean, you know this, every coach knows this. It's just it's hard to actually do. What? So with so much of this is like here's, here's a secret to being more coach-like in a really fast, effective way. And one of the things that you pull out, and I'll even use one of the, the statistics that you quoted, one of the studies that you quoted with Duke University, which I think is mm. another key element of where this goes, is that from these questions then, uh, is keep this, this every listening out there, keep this in mind, is that Duke University states at least 45% of our waking behavior is habitual. And so I think this is a really interesting part of the conversation that you bring up with the coaching habit, is how do we move from these... Uh, from these coaching, uh, from the, the coaching perspective and the questions that are raised there, and then how do we then move it into this key driver of what creates that sustainable long-term change that is not just a conversation as it were. And in doing that, you came up with these five and, and present these five essential components, a reason, a trigger, a micro habit, an effective practice, and a plan. And I was wondering if you just elaborate a little bit more on this process so that those that are out there, when they begin to get these insights, when they reflect on these questions, they can really begin to move it to something that we will be some sustainable change for themselves. Yeah. And, you know, this is it. The, the first chapter of the book is actually all about how do you build a habit? Because there's no point in knowing a bunch of questions if you just carry on doing the same old, same old. And you can't effectively change your behavior unless you really understand habits because habits are the building blocks of behavior change. So, you know, I stand on the shoulders of a lot of people here, you know, Charles Duhigg, The Power of Habit, mm -hmm. BJ Fogg, tinyhabits.com, Leo Babauta, zenhabits.net. Mm -hmm. These are all great thinkers who've really clarified what it takes to build new habits. And in the book, we talk about the new habit formula, which is a simple way to think about habits. And, uh, you know, the idea is that once you figure out habits, you can then figure out where to apply the questions. But as you say, there are kind of five kind of key insights into trying to build this habit. Um, the first is knowing the bigger picture about why you would want to change the old way of working mm -hmm. to do something differently because honestly the old way of working has served you pretty well it's given you something unless you'd have already stopped it so it's like what does it give you and why would you think about doing things differently and you know leo babauta from zen habits which is a great blog if you haven't come across it you know he's like i tried to give up smoking x number of times <laughs> and in the end it was only when i figured out that i was doing this so that i could role model a, a way of behaving and acting for my children mm. that I really got the reason why. The second part you mentioned was the trigger. And that's really about if you don't understand what sets you off, it's almost impossible to change your habits. Uh, you know, Charles Duhigg is very eloquent about this. He says, he talks about the habit loop having three parts to it, mm. the trigger, the behavior, and the reward. Mm -hmm. If you don't actually figure out that it's this thing that makes you automatically just go, oh, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to respond there. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's hard to change because you just keep reacting to the unconscious trigger. Uh, the micro habit, and you know, the, I get this from BJ Fogg. Uh, he, he's got a great free website, tinyhabits.com. Mm -hmm. And his insight was, unless you really can define your habit to take place in 60 seconds or less, it's, it, it's, you tend to create big habits that are basically easy for your big brain to hack. Mm -hmm. So define a habit to take 60 seconds or less. Now, that's really great for me because asking a question always takes 60 seconds or less. But you know, if you're trying to get fit, you're trying to go for a run, don't 
commit to I'm going to run every day. Commit to when you wake up in the morning, put on your running shoes and step out the door. Mm-hmm. You know, see how much more tangible that is? It's like the micro habit that kind of sets you up for the, the bigger habit that you're trying to you know, implement. Mm-hmm. Um, the effective practice is uh, Dan Coyle wrote a book called Talent. Mm. It's Dan Coyle. Talent's not quite the right word, uh, name of the book, but never mind. Mm -hmm. Um, And he talks about what deep practice is. And it's like this. If you want to get good at something, you have to deliberately, thoughtfully, mindfully practice it, not just go through the motions. You know, when I was a kid being forced to learn how to play the piano, you know, doing my daily practice, honestly, the, the wheel was spinning, but the hamster was dead. You know, I wasn't really there, right? Deliberate practices, you're really thoughtful about what you say, you, you how it feels, how it lands, what you do differently next time. And then the fifth part that you mentioned, which is the plan, which is to say, whatever your good intentions are, you're going to fail. You know, it's going to go off the tracks. It's really useful to have a plan for when I fail, when I stumble, how will I get back up and get back into it? Mm-hmm. Rather than going, it's known as the what the hell factor. Going, oh, what the hell? It's all gone to pot now. There's, what's, I, I just, I wasn't going to eat any ice cream, but I've had a, I've had a spoonful of ice cream. I may as well eat the entire tub of ice cream now. <laughs> okay, it's like you want to have a plan to get around that. That's that's a pretty rapid kind of download that's, there. Sure, but uh, yeah. But I, but I think it's I think it's key because I mean the the getting into the real reason for the change that you're trying to make is is always one of those critical ones as opposed to uh, the reason why we think we should be doing something which yes. which never seems to work out so well uh, that awareness around a trigger you know knowing what even puts us in that direction of old versus the direction we want to be in and I really truly appreciate and love the micro habit perspective because it really is let's string together a couple of those small micro habits and before yeah. you know it you're already in the direction of where you want to be as opposed to the direction you don't want to. Uh, yeah. That in and of itself will give that reward uh, that, that'll start to wire you in this new direction. Uh, but the piece that I want to come to is where, where you started to go there at the end of the plan, because I'd love to hear you talk just before we begin to wrap things up around the idea of resistance. Because whether it's been, you know, I, one of my favorite books on, on this topic is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield and how yeah, resistance sure. comes at us from so many directions. But I'd love to just hear a little of your perspective on this, because when we know what to do in the face of resistance, then it feels like we are way ahead of the game before it comes up. Yeah. You know, it's um, the first to notice about it is that's just, it's always going to come up. I mean, I love The War of Art as well. It's a great book worth picking up. Um, Stephen Prestwood's other book that's kind of related to that is called Doing the Work. Yeah. Um, and similar in the sense that, look, it will show up. In some ways, it's a clue that you're actually onto something interesting because when your body's going, no, don't do it, they're kind of sort of holding on to the status quo and feeling anxious about you stepping out towards the edge of yourself, the edge of your competence, the edge of your experience, the edge of your learning. So I really do think it's kind of uh, it comes down to knowing a little bit who you are and how you show up in the world and how you will sabotage yourself. So I think it's really useful to say, look, when any time you're pushing yourself, there's one part of you that's going to do its utmost to sabotage the very mm-hmm. intentions that you have. So how do you do that? How do you get in your own way? And what support do you need around that? Now, coaching, or getting coached is one form of support. Journaling is another form of support. Um, I've had a mastermind group for the last 10 or 11 years, which has been mm-hmm. valuable because... Um, honestly, there's nothing I can pull over those people's eyes anymore. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, Luke, you were saying that you saw me talk at the ICF probably mm-hmm. like seven or eight years ago now. Yeah. Um, so three or f- actually all of the people on that that talk with me, the other three people, they're all part of my mastermind group. Mm. Um, and so we are very good now at knowing each other's patterns, our deceptions, our delusions, and we're very good at kind of holding up that mirror to say, yeah, it's that again, and you should stop doing that. Mm-hmm. So I think resilience is a big part of knowing yourself and knowing where you're vulnerable, knowing where you'll collude to to get yourself off the path you want to be on. So I, I absolutely love that, that idea of that plan and building your resilience and something that we probably don't highlight quite as much as I'd like to. 
uh, but does come up from time to time, is that use of mastermind. So yes, we we hear coaching, we hear books, we hear seminars, we hear all these different things that, that help us encourage ourselves to these other directions. But I love the way that you highlight the mastermind because uh, I've operated with, with masterminds for 15, 20 years now as well. And yeah. you're right, you cannot pull the wool over the eyes of the people in that mastermind group. Uh, yeah, they will I mean, not let you get away with it. Well, you have to... Uh, it's worth making sure you set up your mastermind group properly. I mean, first yes. of all, you've got to do the work to get the right people in, and you never get that right the first time. Right. Some people go, you have to re-recruit. But then you've got to keep sort of keeping the commitment to each other fresh so you don't start kind of settling a little bit because, you know, you then end up at a meta level colluding about not colluding about colluding <laughs> you know, or something. Um, so I know with our group, we've uh, probably four or five times over the 10 years, we've had to kind of do a reset about how do we want to hold each other's feet to the flames in a loving way. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, the, the name of the show is The Meaningful Way, and it's something that uh, our listeners are out there kind of committing themselves to discovering or even walking the meaningful way that they've found. So if I offer up that phrase, meaningful way, I'm curious, what comes to mind for you as to what you have found is your meaningful way? Well, first of all, it's just what the phrase means. And the metaphor or the, the experience that comes to mind or maybe comes to body is the, the times where I've tried to do a walking meditation. Mm. And you know, I don't know if anybody's done that, but it's effectively you slow right down and you deliberately put one foot in front of the other. It sounds very simple. It's amazing how complicated that then becomes because you know, who consciously thinks about walking? Not most of us. So now you're really thinking about what, what's my right foot doing? I'm leaning forward. How does it feel when my left foot hits the ground? How does it feel when my right foot lifts off the ground? Mm -hmm. And that slowing down slows down time, makes you be present, uh, makes you thoughtful about every single step. And for me, part of what really resonates with the, the, the term the meaningful way is that sense of Look, we are all on this path through our lives. <laughs> we have, we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, we get one crack at this, as far as I'm concerned. So this is it. Um, do you want to be awake during this, or do you not want to be kind of semi-awake? And for me, I would love to be awake, and it's hard. You know, it's so easy to <clears throat> slip into good work, mm -hmm. be busy, be over-committed, be over-engaged. How do you actually have the courage to? break out of that mm. think about what your great work might be work that has more impact work that has more meaning and once you get that each each time you think about what your great work might be i think you provide a potential path for the meaningful way mm. Michael, I want to just thank you for being here on the podcast, on The Meaningful Way, and sharing uh, your stories, your uh, creativity, your impact, as well as your wisdom with all of our listeners. Yeah, my pleasure. It's nice to talk to you again, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Michael. And for everybody out there, I guess maybe the way that I'd like to wrap up today is to encourage you to be a bit of an evocateur, to evoke, to provoke that impact that you want to have, not even just on the world, but even on yourself and the people closest to you. So when you begin to consider that, you can think about the impact, you can think the meaning that it holds, because I know in hearing from Michael and even speaking a little bit for him, we would all encourage you to continue to do great work. And so with that, as always, as we wrap up our episode, I encourage you until next time to continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for tuning in to The Meaningful Way. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and please subscribe and follow along with all these great guests, their stories and interviews. Also, it helps us a lot if you not only share some of your favorite episodes online, but also provide us feedback. Go into iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast app happens to be and rate the show. Provide us some feedback and let us know how it is that we're doing. If you want to learn more about what we're up to, whether it be with the IPEC Coach Training School, the Live, Lead, Play Network, or even just what's evolving with The Meaningful Way, go on and head on over to LukeIorio.com. Mm -hmm.